Days of violence in Ethiopia have shown its growing ethnic divide. It follows the killing of a popular singer and activist. The Prime Minister says it was a plot to destabilize the country. But how to bridge the divide? And what's next for Ethiopia? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Ethiopia has suffered days of unrest since the killing of a prominent musician and activist. More than 90 people were killed in protests following the death of the ethnic Oromo singer Hachalo Hundesa. The 34-year-old was shot dead in Addis Ababa on Monday night. Large crowds gathered for his funeral in his hometown of Ambo on Thursday. Hachalo's songs focus on the rights of the Oromo people. They became anthems in the wave of anti-government protests between 2015 and 2018. On Friday, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed held an emergency meeting over Hachalu's killing. He says the assailants want to trigger civil unrest and derail Ethiopia's democratic reforms. In our country, Ethiopia, for a very long time, some have been planning and plotting a scheme to start a civil war to pit people against one another and to derail the peace process and democratic reforms we've started and to stop our agendas using all means, including weapons, media and money. As if it were a stage production around the country, they've created over the last few days a problem that has its own writers and performers. And Catherine Soy is following developments from neighboring Kenya. She says Ethiopia's prime minister is also blaming what he calls external forces for instigating the unrest. In the last two years or so, a lot of Ethiopians who were in exile, who had fled the country, were allowed to come back uh, home. So the, the prime minister there saying that some of these people, instead of engaging with the government, uh, having meaningful, meaningful dialogue on how to solve some of the problems that are afflicting Ethiopians, this, some of these people have decided to take up arms. He says that some of these groups are using a slogan uh, called we will start and finish in Addis. Addis is a capital city. He says that basically this is this means that they are targeting the capital city Addis Ababa because of all the huge development projects going on and they just don't want to destabilize the capital Addis but the country as a whole. It's also important to note uh, that uh, in the last few days the, pr the Prime Minister as well as some of his government officials have been talking about external forces that have a hand uh, in what has been going on. He did not expound on what uh, is, he meant uh, by external forces, but he did mention that these protests have, have come at a very crucial time uh, when there are talks going on at the UN Security Council, talks about the construction of this huge uh, dam project that is going on, a project uh, that has been contested by uh, Egypt and um, Sudan. Uh, the, Ethiopia is going to start filling the dam soon. So the president says that this protest really are derailing those efforts and they come at a very critical time. Well, let's take a look at how Hachalu's killing fueled the grievances of the Oromo. Ethiopia's largest ethnic groups say they've suffered a long history of oppression dating back a century. In 2015, plans to expand the capital further into Oromo farmlands triggered three years of protests and violent repression. This eventually forced the resignation of the prime minister it paved the way for Abiy Ahmed and Oromo himself to take over that job. But some now accuse him of neglecting the community, just like leaders of the past. Let's introduce our panel of guests then. We have joining us from Rome, Letitia Bader, Horn of Africa Director at Human Rights Watch. In London, Arwal Allo, a senior lecturer in law at Keele University in the UK. And in Washington, D.C., David Shin, a former U.S. ambassador to Ethiopia. Good to have you all with us. If I could start with Arwal, is Ethiopia on the verge of breakdown, Arwal? Well, I think situations are looking extremely shaky. And if the government doesn't really take a radical measure, and I actually don't see that happening at this stage, I think the country is certainly on a very difficult, very complicated path. If I could just give you some context in terms of what's happening now, you know, the the government's um, 
the very days that a very iconic, a very towering figure who helped this very government usher to power, on the very day this important figure was killed, also decided to arrest some of the most prominent uh, politicians that represent the Oromo community. Uh, people from the Oromo Federalist Congress, such as Jawar Mohammed and Bekele Gerba, other individuals from that same party, and then also individuals from the Oromo Liberation Front. Now, if you really wanted to calm the situation, you cannot do that on the very day that this community was supposed to mourn and properly bury uh, this iconic figure. And also, the figure himself, Ajahn Hundesa, he was somebody that people expected to be given a proper send-off that's really appropriate to his profile within this community, and the government didn't do that. The government essentially rushed uh, his burial. They took him to uh, his uh, um, local uh, village, which most people saw as a sign of disrespect from the prime minister, uh, who came to power on the back of the sacrifice of the Oromo people. But over the course of the last two years, really, instead of delivering on the promises, on the key demands of the Oromo people, essentially betrayed those causes, betrayed his own colleagues. Um, well, and all right. That, hang on, hang on, Arwal. But before we go too deeply into the whole history of, uh, shall we say, complaints of the Oromo population, let me ask Letitia, is it any clearer at this point the, the really basic, simple questions? Who killed Hachalu and why? I think that remains a, a very big question, and I think it is one of the key reasons right now why the government absolutely needs to lift its internet um, shutdown. I think people have very valid questions. I think, I mean, the shutdown is having a whole range of impacts. It means that families aren't able to find out about what's happening to their loved ones in different parts of the country. It means that uh, in independent media organizations aren't really able to report on very important developments, security developments, etc. But it also means that basically, as one of the individuals we interviewed in the last few days said, you know, the government is saying that they will investigate, but we don't really know. They haven't really told us what's going on. And I think this is a context in which it creates almost a person perfect environment for a lot of misinformation and a lot of rumours. But people deserve to know All right, what, what, Letitia, what is going if I, on. if I can jump in, since we don't have... Let me uh, play devil's advocate here and, and give you the line from the Ethiopian authorities. They say some groups are using this current situation um, and using and abusing the sort of political opening uh, that was given and allowed them to, to be welcomed back into the fold to rearm instead of engaging intellectually, and therefore they have to take some very, very serious emergency measures. And any country in a sort of emergency situation has to take emergency measures. How do you respond to that? I would say, first of all, they have been taking emergency measures for over a year now, which have actually added to a lot of grievances. I mean, we are talking about a country in which many parts of the Oromia region, but not only the Oromia region, are actually under a de facto state of emergency. And we've been documenting over the last year quite serious abuses in the context of counterinsurgency operations in those areas. Um, by government forces. Um, at the same time, obviously, these are very volatile areas. There is also um, a, a failed attempt um, in many ways, and I think uh, it was quite a weak attempt in the first place, to really engage previous um, opposition parties as well. So I think there are real questions here around why they are taking these very heavy-handed measures now, but also whether there had been a genuine in, um, attempt to make sure that all different voices, and here we're not only talking about people in positions of uh, political oppositions, people with, with who do have a voice in, in many ways, but also ordinary people who have grievances, who want those to be heard, and who feel right now that they're not being heard. All right, Ambassador David, officials are blaming what they call external forces. What do you make of suggestions that at least part of what's going on is a foreign plot to destabilize Ethiopia, perhaps even to disrupt the uh, dam project, which has proved so worrying for its neighbors. Well, I, I suspect that what is happening in Ethiopia today is driven primarily by internal developments and internal forces. I don't rule out the possibility of some foreign involvement just stirring up trouble for the sake of stirring up trouble. It's possible. 
but it's very hard to control that. Uh, and if, for example, it's related to the um, discussions on the um, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam on the Blue Nile and problems between Egypt and uh, Ethiopia, uh, it's, I think it would be very hard for Egypt to uh, control what actually happens uh, inside Ethiopia other than just creating trouble. So my, my guess is that this is more related to, uh, to an internal situation. Why, I wonder, our wall, I mean, as Letitia pointed out, there's, there's been a bit of a history of grievances on the part of the Oromo people, arbitrary arrests, um, torture, even extrajudicial killings have been documented by human rights groups. Why has the killing of Hachalu in particular proved so explosive? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a very important question. Can I just comment on uh, uh, Ambassador's point, which is uh, right. the allegation there might be external forces that are using a kind of fifth column within, within the country. Now, while it is you know, difficult to rule out the possibility that countries like Egypt might have an interest in instigating chaos in Ethiopia, we have not seen any evidence. Uh, so in, the, in a country where you have a consistent culture of externalizing internal problems, it is very difficult to take that seriously. Um, and there are clearly other forces, including the government, who would have the interest to cause the kinds of things that are going on now. Um, to return back to, to the question, um, yes, historically, uh, Oromos uh, have been politically repressed and economically uh, deprived and culturally subordinated. And the reason why we saw the kind of mobilization that brought Abiy Ahmed himself to power between 2015 and 2018 is precisely because uh, of those extreme repressions. Um, and but, when but to, to, be, to be clear, Arwal, they're not the only ethnic group in Ethiopia that has grievances and claims of, uh, you know, being oppressed. No, absolutely, absolutely. But what makes the Oromo somewhat different is the fact that they are the majority in that country. So the, the second um, uh, largest group in the country, uh, Italy Kamharas, are people who actually have been constantly on power in the Ethiopian state for a long period of time. Other groups are, relatively speaking, smaller in size. So the fact that you have a federal state structure that says we have a system that allows particular groups uh, representation and autonomy at the regional level and also the right to share the rule at the center. Now, if you are the majority and if the system says that based on your identity, you get to represent yourself at the center and also you get to rule yourself at the local level, and you don't have that, of course, as a majority, your voice is going to be prominent. It's going to be more audible. And precisely for that reason that we more uh, hear the voices of the Oromo compared to the other uh, smaller groups. But, you know, when Abiy Ahmed came to power, people thought that Ethiopia is changing. And I personally believed, like so many other people, that we now have an opportunity. Well, a lot uh, of but things did of change, didn't it? To be fair to the government. Well, uh, there are some very positive steps that have been taken in terms of widening the space initially. But obviously, in a, in a kind of in a democratizing empire where you have so many structural issues and so many cleavages, I think the challenge is to actually address your key constitutional questions, coming up with the political settlements that All right, let, in let, let me bring, if I can, Letitia in. Doesn't change take time in a, a very complicated political and ethnic landscape like Ethiopia? I mean, it wasn't long ago the Prime Minister was being hailed for his reforms, releasing people from prison, announcing an end to sort of political detentions, mm -hmm. even won a Nobel Prize, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, but I think, you know, a, a lot of the concerns that, that we, amongst others, have been voicing as well is that the first three months, there were some amazing reforms which were implemented. Um, and I think what we have seen is both a stalling of, of some of the reforms. We have seen some steps back. I mean, one of the areas and one of the commitments the government had made was, was to reform some of the legislation which had been used again and again to basically criminalise 
peaceful dissent. And what we've seen is the government coming out with a new tool, um, the hate speech law, which we have raised a range of concerns with. So I think we have both seen a slowing down of reforms, but we have also seen step backs. And we've also seen step backs in practices, as I was just raising again, concerns around counterinsurgency campaigns in the Oramia region. Um, but I think, you know, coming back to your question, these abuses are not only in the Oromia region, but I think, you know, coming back to, to this issue of why Hachalu as well, I mean, I think what brought Abi to power was also a moment where there was a lot of hope. I mean, a lot of young Oromos, first and foremost, obviously the protest movement was joined by many other groups over the years, but initially it was a lot of young Oromo students, a lot of them, a lot of them school children who were going and putting themselves on the front line. And, and, and basically it was a moment of hope when Abi came to power. And I think, I mean, Hachalu, actually, we used to interview a lot of young people who were arrested only because they had some of his music on their telephone. And yet they were still willing to put that music on their phone because right. of what he was singing for, the hope he was giving them. So I, I think really highlighting how, you know, after a moment of hope to see that abuses are continuing, that reforms, which, yes, take time, but are sometimes actually backsliding, is is very, very worrying for many people. Ambassador David, um, you know Ethiopia very well. How much of the current anger do you see directed at the prime minister himself being an Oromo? You know, I'd like to make one uh, clarification on the Oromo. The Oromo. The Oromo are the largest ethnic group in Ethiopia. They're not a majority, however. They're a plurality. Uh, they're clearly less than 51% uh, of the population. Uh, as far as this being directed at, uh, at Abiy uh, Ahmed himself, for, for internal political purposes, some of it is directed at him uh, in order for other uh, opposition parties, including Oromo opposition parties, uh, to make uh, Abiy Ahmed look bad and eventually defeat him uh, in, in the political process whenever elections are rescheduled. They were to have taken place uh, in August of this year, and, and now they're postponed indefinitely. So there, some of it is aimed at him personally. Uh, he has lost a great deal of the um, uh, sort of panache that he, he had when he first became prime minister. It was something of a surprise prime minister, and a lot of that has dissipated for the reasons that the others on the panel have, have discussed. And I think he has made mistakes. Uh, particularly the arrest of um, of opposition leaders, I, I just don't see what that accomplishes. Ambassador, um, do you do you so see you, how great do you think the risk is that this can go into full blown ethnic conflict? Uh, I don't rule that out, but you know, Ethiopia in in the last uh, couple of decades has had so much uh, ethnic conflict of one kind or another. It's it's shifted in terms of where it has occurred in the country and who has been involved in it. Uh, but they have managed to muddle through uh, every time. And I think there's a good chance that Ethiopia will muddle through again. Um, this is not the best outcome, obviously, but mm. muddling through is probably better than a, um, a, a revolution that just gets totally out of control. So I, I do see the, the current situation is very worrisome, but I certainly don't see it as hopeless. Letitia, is there a risk of all the political progress that's being made now being rolled back. I mean, how worried you, are you about that? We are very worried. I mean, I, I think we are worried because just looking at the response in the last few days, we are both seeing the government resort to very widely used, trodden paths in terms of notably the arrest of opposition leaders, um, shutting down of at least one media outlet and, and others have actually been raided as well. I mean, this is this is something we have had to document in Ethiopia over and over again. So, I mean, we're, we're both seeing a return to practices which are definitely not going to contribute in any space or form to creating, uh, a, you know, democratic space and to allowing people to have very basic rights to information, etc., and media freedoms. Um, and at the same time, I mean, you know, what we've seen in the last few days in terms of both protests, unrest and communal violence, I mean, we are still trying to understand. I mean, obviously, we are also um, suffering the consequence of the internet shutdown to really understand town by town what 
happened, and again, I mean, a lot of this happened in towns. A lot of these unrests and protests and violences are happening in towns. People are coming in from the countryside into towns to protest, but also in terms of the violence that breaks out. So we are also documenting cases of communal violence and especially targeting of private property in many towns. Um, I mean, it, 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 you know, the, the reports we're receiving now is that it has calmed down. But one of our concerns is that this is we're now seeing cycles of these violence. And each time the government initially commits to investigate, this was the same with the October violence last year, which affected many parts of Oromia. But then there's never really any follow through, both in terms of the investigations, no communication about how the investigations ended, what happened, but also what the government is doing, if anything, to make sure this doesn't happen again. That's and amazing. Really important point. That's a really important point, and that segues nicely to my next question for Arwald. I mean, despite all the progress that the Prime Minister has made politically, and listening to what people like Letitia say, it does sound like not enough attention has been paid to healing some of the ethnic uh, grievances and tensions, and it does sound, you know, what Letitia just said about attacks on private property, it does sound like ethnic community against ethnic community now, not just the people versus the government sort of narrative, right? Unfortunately, when you have um, attacks against uh, prominent individuals, uh, people like Haji Alu uh, who was really, you know, essentially the definitive sound of the Oromo revolution that brought Abiy Ahmed to power, you do have people who become angry and resort to this kind of, um, you know, irresponsible attack against um, individual citizens, ordinary citizens. And Ali Ahmed really had a fantastic opportunity to bring people together uh, to work on reconciliation and build a national consensus. As soon as he came to power, he established a national uh, to his commission, he established some other com uh, other commissions, and those commissions, it seems to me now, were really simply strategic maneuvers in order for him to consolidate power. None of those institutions have done anything, even people who committed assaults that have been documented extensively by human rights organizations, including Human Rights Watch, uh, even those people who have been perpetrating those atrocities for the last 25 years have not been properly held accountable. Uh, the moment they started um, trying those people. At the same time, they were running, um, you know, show trials on, on the media. So the practices of the past have essentially continued. But now the challenge really is that Abi no longer have the support of the Oromo people from which he comes, precisely because he knew how, where how he was going. How do we know that? How do we know that, Arwo? Because we haven't had elections well, yet, that, have we? Yeah, no, we didn't. And I think one of the reasons why the election seems to be postponed indefinitely in a manner that is constitutionally dubious is precisely because it dismantled the previous party that kind of had ethnic components and created a pan-Ethiopian party. Uh, he knows that the thinking, the kind of political consciousness around the Oromo people is still one that is in water right. making, and one focus on almost as, as a nation. He moved from that. And I think one of the people, one of the reasons why people think okay. betrayed is because he's moving away. All right, past, we've got 60 seconds left. I want to quickly ask Ambassador David in 60 seconds. What can the outside world do at this point to help ease this transition in Ethiopia? I think I would start by uh, urging uh, that the political prisoners who have recently been, uh, been taken be released. Uh, I, that does not uh, help the situation. And I think um, uh, the friends of Ethiopia are in a position to make that uh, message loud and clear to Abiy Ahmed and, and the government. Uh, other than that, uh, I think it's important to continue to be supportive of the reform program in Ethiopia. Uh, both financially and, and uh, from the standpoint of supporting it uh, orally, uh, I, this is not the time to, to leave Ethiopia to itself. And also to look very hard at, at who killed uh, the Oromo musician and, and uh, what was behind that. Uh, I think it's very important to try to determine right. what touched this whole recent series of events. All right, let's thank our guests because we are... Uh... Having to wrap things up now, let's thank very much Letitia Bader, Arwal Allo, and Ambassador David Shin.
And thanks for watching too. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here for now is goodbye.